I'm very reluctant to criticize judges who I think by and large do a wonderful job, very conscientious, fair-minded. I have to agree with the assessment that in this case, Judge Glanville was off the reservation, really ab initio when he decided to have this meeting with the reluctant witness, with the prosecutors, and not giving uh, young thugs counsel, Brian Steele, notice of this. I think that was his first mistake. I've never heard of a judge having that kind of ex parte meeting without at least apprising the other side. So that was the first thing that shocked me. Hey guys, it's your girl, Melanie, and we have Ben Chu. I'm gonna be doing um, basically a review of Ben Chu's interview of long crime uh, and basically giving it a quick analysis on what is happening in the Young Thug Rico trial, Fulton County, and what this judge has done about the secret meeting, the ex parte meeting that we know was illegal and criminal and how he tried to lock up um, Brian Steele for calling him out, calling his crime out, all of that. And uh, uh, so Ben Chu is Johnny Depp's attorney. He was the lead attorney to got, that got Johnny Depp off, not off, but helped him win against Amber Heard. Keep in mind, he is a civil attorney, so his expertise are not within the criminal court. He also is not, you know, staying abreast to what is going on in this entire, you know, uh, yeah, Rico trial against Young Thug. So they're kind of showing him clips and giving him bits and pieces, but they don't, you know, he doesn't have the full picture, but he does give some analysis. And because he is Johnny Depp's attorney, I thought it would be important to see this. I'll be bringing you more clips of different legal analysis that have just scorched this judge and the entire Fulton County DA's office and saying that they need to be investigated for corruption and crimes. So make sure you stay tuned for that. So you're gonna have to be subscribed and hit the notification bell because you're not going to miss this. So now let's get into what um, Ben uh, what uh, Ben Chu has to say, Johnny Depp's attorney in, in the Amber Heard case that took place about two years ago. Gonna hold you under, um, still hold you in summary criminal contempt. We are still reeling from the judge to talk about it. It seems so much of our discussion as of late on this case has to do with the back and forth between the attorney to jail seven and not giving do what I was told. Attorney Bradford Cohen, who we've had here on Sidebar before numerous times, Kodak Black's lawyer, here's what he posted on X. Quote, this case and judge is off the reservation. He said, this is an instant mistrial. I cannot believe the judge thinks taking a defense attorney into custody isn't a mistrial. Brian Steele is a real one. Defense lawyers across the country should be terrified by the lack of judicial knowledge. Well, let me see if my next guest agrees. Joining me right now is acclaimed trial attorney, Ben Chu, who famously represented Johnny Depp in his case. I'm kind of disturbed because that's ex parte. This All that was an ex parte conversation. How did you find out about any of that? Mr. Steele, I am gonna hold you under, um, still hold you in summary criminal contempt. We are still reeling from the judge holding Young Thug's attorney in contempt of court with him about to spend 20 days in jail in a cell alongside his client, but the Georgia Supreme Court has just stepped in to stop it. There has been a lot of blowback against the judge in the legal community, so we're gonna bring on acclaimed trial attorney Ben Chu, the man who famously represented Johnny Depp in his infamous trial, to get his take on who's right here. As we discussed on a previous sidebar, we're still trying to make sense of this latest legal mess in the Young Thug trial out of Atlanta, Georgia. The rapper, real name Jeffrey Lamar Williams, who along with several others has been charged in this wide sweeping racketeering indictment, accusing them of operating a criminal street gang known as YSL. It is a case that's been ongoing for what, a year and a half due to a number of issues, such as, I don't know, almost a year of jury selection. And while we really haven't talked that much about the actual charges and the actual evidence so much, we have before, we've talked about it. It seems so much of our discussion as of late on this case has to do with the back and forth between the attorneys and the judge. And as we reported, there was this massive development concerning Young Thug's attorney, Brian Steele. You see, Judge Ural Glanville held Brian Steele in contempt of court for not revealing how Steele found out about the judge having a private meeting with a prosecution witness and the prosecutors. This is a big deal because that witness, Kenneth Copeland, AKA Little Woody, in that meeting 
allegedly said he would testify to being the killer of Donovan Thomas. Why is that important? Because Williams is accused of renting a car that was used in that drive-by shooting of Thomas back in 2015. This hearing is called, or I should say this meeting is called an ex parte meeting where the defense was essentially excluded. They weren't even notified of the meeting. They weren't a part of it. Obviously, that can create an issue when you talk about a defendant's due process rights, ability to hear all the evidence against him, especially with a witness that was already sworn into court and had testified. Well, maybe I should say testified in air quotes because at that point he had actually pretty much pled the fifth for most of it, answered a few questions. It's interesting because he was granted partial immunity for his testimony. But Mr. Steele, let's go back to him. He also alleged that in that meeting, a prosecutor had essentially threatened Copeland that he would remain locked up until the cases for all 26 defendants were resolved. So Steele was held in contempt because he refused to give up his source on how he found out about that meeting. He said it violates his ethical obligations to reveal that source. Let me just add this in that he did not mention that the prosecutor and the judge basically, little Woody said that he was just going to lie on the stand and the prosecutor said that that was okay and the judge was in there when little Woody said he's just going to get up there and commit perjury and they said that we will not prosecute you for perjury and they encouraged him to lie on the stand. I actually have another legal analysis that is coming up that we're going to review. Um, and again, guys, I'm not a legal expert, so I'm using other legal experts so we can get more clarification. We can see with our eyes and ears that this is the most corrupt case we've ever seen. We, we can see, well, not ever seen, but there's been many others, but Right here is exposing the complete corruption that is in Fulton County. And it's important to understand these things because think about it. Young Thug has money. Young Thug, this is televised. If they're willing to do this right here with a televised national, you know, attention trial, imagine what they've done to defendants who basically have, don't have, you know, money, who they're using um, a court appointed attorney, or it's not televised. Think of if they're willing to do this so brazenly in this case, imagine what Fulton County has done to others. D.A. Willis and this Judge Glanville, they, they are corrupt from top to bottom. Many legal experts have said, and I'm again, I'm going to bring you another legal analysis where they said that the entire D.A.'s office needs to be under investigation as well as this judge and several other. And if, and if this judge who was the head judge head judge in all of Fulton County is doing these things. Imagine what people underneath him are doing, the trickle down effect of the corruption that is in Fulton County. The judge sentenced him to 10 weekends behind bars, 20 days with Steele reporting to jail 7 p.m. Friday night. Actually, the judge agreed to allow Steele to spend that time sharing a cell with his client, Williams. It's like my cousin Vinny, but in real life. But now the Georgia Supreme Court has stepped in and they actually granted Steele's emergency motion for bond and they paused that sentence from being imposed. So it, by all accounts, he's not going to have to report to jail on Friday night. We're but what's important about that and is how this ties to Trump, I mentioned it several times because a lot of people still do not understand. So bear with me. Ashley Merchant, who was one of Trump's co-defendant lawyers in the um, Georgia in election interference RICO trial against Trump and his co-defendants. So Ashley Merchant, who brought down Fannie Willis, who basically exposed her corruption, her relationship with Nathan Wade and what has stopped that RICO case. She is Brian Steele's attorney because she actually is president of a organization that represents presents defense attorneys down there in Georgia. She is the one that that really went to court and, and took this judge to task and also filed the motion along with Brian Steele's wife filed the motion to actually um, have this go before an uh, appeals judge. The appeals judge actually sent it up to the Supreme Court of Georgia. That's where the jurisdiction is. So the Supreme Court of Georgia is now reviewing this. And, and even though they stopped him, gave him supersedious bond, meaning he didn't have to pay anything, but they argued that he has a right to bond. 
and, and it basically what judge Glanville did was illegal. They are going to be investigating him and this office because it ties into the ex parte meeting. So guys get ready. It's going to explode. We're going to see the, the doors blown off on all of the corruption that many of us have known that is going down in Fulton County. We've known about it since the election of 2020, but now we are going to see how deep the corruption goes and really from the top to bottom. And I wonder how much, you know, if, if this is happening in Fulton County, what's happening in other counties, and does it lead all the way to the governor's office? Because this is insane that they would even allow these things to continue to happen. We're going to talk about that, but it doesn't quite resolve the whole issue of contempt that's still on the table. And I will tell you right now, there has been a lot of blowback against Judge Euro Glanville for doing this. Tons of comment, commentators, including on social media, legal minds, legal experts, they've spoken out. To give you an idea, attorney Bradford Cohen, who we've had here on Sidebar before numerous times, Kodak Black's lawyer, here's what he posted on X. Quote, this case and judge is off the reservation. He said, this is an instant mistrial. I cannot believe the judge thinks taking a defense attorney into custody isn't a mistrial. Brian Steele is a real one. Defense lawyers across the country should be terrified by the lack of judicial knowledge. Well, let me see if my next guest agrees. Joining me right now is acclaimed trial attorney, Ben Chu, who famously represented Johnny Depp in his case against Amber Heard. Friend of the program, I like to say friend of mine. Uh, great to see you, Ben, great to have you on. Let me just get your initial take on this. Where do you stand? Uh, where do you throw your opinion into this, what is essentially a legal mess? Well, Jesse, I'm honored to be considered a friend of yours and it's great to see you again. So thank you for that. Uh, I think that I'm very reluctant to criticize judges who I think by and large do a wonderful job, very conscientious, fair-minded. I have to agree with the assessment of that in this case, Judge Glanville was off the reservation, really ab initio when he decided to have this meeting with the reluctant witness, with the prosecutors, and not giving uh, young thugs counsel, Brian Steele, notice of this. I think that was his first mistake. I've never heard of a judge having that kind of ex parte meeting without at least apprising the other side. So that was the first thing that shocked me. Well, now I'm going to play you some of the back and forth between uh, Steele and Glanville in court. Want your take on it. This is from the other day. Let's play it. I was told based upon information and belief that when we arrived at 8 30, 9 o'clock today, um, we did not come into your courtroom until almost 11, 1130. And what I found out just recently, this is not waived, is that um, supposedly in chambers, this honorable court, honorable court reporter at times, honorable court at times, district attorney or district attorneys from the DA's office, as well as investigators, sheriff deputies, Mr. Copeland and his counsel uh, met together. None of the defense team, to my knowledge, was aware that this was going on. And then somehow that email was CC'd to me. That never- Mr. Uh, Mr. Steele, can I interrupt you for just a second? I'm kind of disturbed because that's ex parte. This All that was an ex parte conversation. How did you find out about any of that? Well, I'm disturbed too. What I was told was that Mr. Copeland said- And you haven't answered my question yet. I'm not How going did to answer you that question. You're not? No, I will not answer that question. Why will you not answer that question? Because I want to make sure that what I say is accurate and I'm not trying no, to get no, anybody no, no. else. I'm asking you, how did you get this information? I'm not telling the court. What I'm saying is based on information. Okay, please. well, listen, if you don't tell me how you got this information, then you and I are going to have some problems. We can have this. I have problems right now. It, it concerns told... me that you have proprietary information. Why is it proprietary? information that, that, that you should not be having that was ex parte. Why? With a party. Why? State of Georgia. How about the witness? How about Mr. Copeland, who supposedly announced he's not testifying and he'll sit for two years and then supposedly no, that's this honorable court. OK, or excuse me, let me rephrase that. This court supposedly said I can hold you until the end of this trial. Miss Hilton supposedly said actually all of the defendants and then all 26 people are disposed of. If that's true, what this is, is coercion, witness intimidation ex parte communications that we have a constitutional right to be present for. Why did Sir, I'm going to hold you in contempt if you don't tell me who this information is. I don't want to be from. held in contempt. Well, I'm not then, answering that question. 
That's attorney-client privilege information. I am not answering Attorney-client privilege. Unless you were in my chambers, that's I'm, the only way you can figure out. I am telling you. I tell you, you what, I'm going to give you five minutes. If you don't tell me don't who, have you, to, I'm if gonna you don't tell me who it is, I'm going to put you in, I'm, 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 I'm going to put you in contempt. Okay. So now the judge did call for a five-minute recess, and when he came back, he still demanded to know how Steele had learned about that private meeting. Let's listen. Mr. Steele, before I recessed, um, I asked you, how did you get this information? And it is not covered by work product. There's only one way you could have gotten it. So I'm, I'm going to ask you again. If you don't tell me how you got the information, I'm going to hold you in contempt. I understand. I don't want to be held in contempt. And I don't want to hold you in contempt, but you, oh. but, but, it, but it's, but this is so sacrosanct to have a conversation in my chambers parroted to you and others. It is that serious. Yeah. And that's why I raise it. It is that serious that we should have been there and it shouldn't have happened. Sir, that's a, that's a how, whole, that's a whole separate issue. And this, that, that's that, why, that is that's why ex parte conversations are recorded. Why, why would it but, be ex parte? Be, You're acting like it's ex parte under it's seal. It's ex parte. It, no, it's ex parte because that's what the state asked me to do. It's just like when you asked me I've for never, an ex parte conversation. I've never asked this honorable court or any court to meet with me and a witness. Sir, tell, you're you're straying off the issue. I'm not. I'm the issue to is the issue is. How did you, who? How did you get this information? I understand the issue. I, I promise you, I understand it. But what I'm trying to ask you is, if you look at Common Five, this is how I understand the law. You cannot. You can't violate something and then and then use privilege. Okay? I'm not violating anything. Okay, but that's why I'm saying, how did you get the information? But. Just listen to what I'm trying to tell you. I'm, you're, okay, you're but saying, see, you're the, threatening me with the contempt. privilege Just would to occur. It. The privilege in 1.6 would occur if you if you were in the right place, right time to begin with. You weren't. Let, let me tell you. I'm just reading from it. But if I'm reading it wrong, I'm not trying to. It says 1.6 applies not merely to matters communicated in confidence by the client, but also to all information gained in the professional relationship, whatever its source. So you're asking me to break, you're ordering me, maybe, you're asking me, you're, I'm not saying you're ordering me, but to give you information, and you're saying it's not some substance, but I'm telling you, I can't do that under the bar rules. All right, well, I'm going to hold you in contempt, and um, you can you can think about it, five o'clock today, we'll see we'll see where you are at that stand on that point, because no, that's well, not what I, that's not what I understand the rule to be. I've, I've not asked you some in substance of what was said. I asked you how you got it. I can't do that. Yes, you can, because I have an idea how you got it. Well, your idea I have may an be idea wrong. how you got it, but that's improper. Sir. Your idea may be wrong, and you're asking me to... Listen, I told you the first time, and I'm not going to breach that wanna, confidence. I don't want to hold you in contempt, but it, this is that serious. Judge, I'm you, the cannot one ease, the... you cannot eavesdrop and get get information that was not not meant for you to hear at that particular point in time. Don't you... Okay, so Ben, there is a number of issues here because he was held in contempt. Let's first start with the idea. Does he have an ethical obligation to not reveal to the court that where he got this information about the ex parte meeting? Jesse, you're right. This is almost like a law school exam because there's so many potential issues here. But uh, I think he's got a colorable argument uh, that it is attorney work product. And I think that probably merits a separate hearing. It, it sounds like an issue of su significant magnitude that sh it should be briefed and argued before there's any finding of contempt. Because well, the well, well let, let, let me let me even double down on that. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. Let's just say somebody from that meeting, let's say it was an attorney for Mr. Copeland, gave him that information. Is that privileged? Is that in the sense if because I read the 1.6 rule that he, he talked about, it says whatever its source, you know, that could be part of something that he doesn't have to reveal. Is that privileged communication? He cannot reveal it to the court and let alone in open court. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think I, and I and I follow your judgment. I, I think it's at the very least a colorable argument that should be considered and briefed so that there is a record before the judge went to the very serious issue of contempt, which not only affects the attorney, but more importantly, infects, uh, affects the integrity of the trial of Young Thug and makes it vulnerable should it result in a guilty verdict uh, 
of attack on appeal, which is not in, in really anybody's interest. You think the judge overreacted by, um, by, by, by holding him in contempt? Because couldn't another option have been him asking him to tell him privately in chambers where you got this information? That's an excellent suggestion. I, I think so. But I, I also understand it now, having heard the back and forth, I can understand the judge's perspective, too, because I, I do believe that Steele went out of his way to be provocative. I've never spoken to a judge the way that Mr. Steele spoke to the judge, interrupting the judge, not showing the usual respect that judges are accorded. So I can understand why that got under the judge's skin. So I, I can see that the two were clearly speaking past each other. The judge was concerned rightly about uh, the lack of, uh, you know, the, the lack of security of the conversation, which he clearly intended to be uh, kept confidential. But you also uh, sympathize with Mr. Steele, who had to raise this issue on the record so right. that he could preserve the record. So I don't think he had any choice, but I, I, I think he could have gone about it in a more respectful manner. So talk to me about the idea of the... I think one of the things is Ben Chu may not have been following this case and doesn't understand that this judge is combative, that he shuts down the defense with every motion. He has allowed the the prosecutor, the corrupt prosecutor, to do whatever they want in this case. There have been a number of things that have happened that are improper, that are automatic mistrial. And just, I think the frustration that came from Brian Steele is, is, is outlandish. And like even he even said, it's off the reservation for a judge to have this private meeting between the prosecutor and a sworn in witness and basically do witness intimidation. So if you are the defense attorney, Brian Steele, you're going to be outraged, anger and everything else. I don't know. One of the things that Brian Steele does, and people say this, he is very respectful of the courts, that he has a wonderful re uh, reputation. This is why so many, you know, lawyers have come out to defend him because he is he has an upstanding reputation one of the things that he always addresses the court as and he has done in this case is your this honorable court while he was in the middle of giving his argument he said this honorable court and then he just changed it to this court and that is he's never done that before because this has been a dishonorable this entire thing has been dishonorable and corrupt from up and down. So I think if Ben Chu had more information to see exactly how this judge is the person who interrupts, he's the one that has just shut down. I mean, he doesn't even listen to objections before he, he overrules. He does not care anything that the prosecution wants to do and get away with. He allows them to do it. And he has shut down the defense so many times improperly. It is, it's unconscionable how corrupt this judge actually is and how corrupt the DA is in its own full display on camera with our own eyes and ears, we can see it. So I think this is where, you know, he's trying to be respectful of the judge, but he's really not having a full understanding of exactly what has gone down in this case. Ex parte meeting though, in and of itself, is it wrong for the judge to have a private meeting with a sworn witness, the prosecutors, and not notify the defense because the judge seemed to defend. This was an ex parte communication. How did you know about this? Um, does a de criminal defendant, does defense counsel have a right to know, A, that the meeting happened and B, uh, what was discussed in that meeting? I think certainly, Jesse, that the defense counsel, Mr. Steele, had a right to know that this meeting was taking place. Uh, in advance so that he would have the opportunity to raise an objection to it. And certainly he had a right to know that the meeting was taking place with the prosecutor and the witness. I think it would have been more appropriate for the judge if the judge thought an ex party meeting with the reluctant witness was necessary. He should have apprised both parties in advance that this is what he intended to do so that they could make their objections, if any, on the record. But I think it's it's unfair and improper for one side to have been present in the meeting, the prosecution, and the other side, Mr. Steele, to be excluded. So I think there are at least two issues there. So, so um, there are more issues we're about to get into. The idea of one of the attorneys has asked the judge to step down from the case. Um, there's going to be another issue where the judge has set a hearing to determine how that information got out. We'll get to that in a second. What I want to get to you. What I want to get to now 
is the fact that Ashley Merchant, who is a very well-known Atlanta defense attorney, she jumped in to represent Brian Steele when he was held in contempt of court. And there was this back and forth about civil contempt versus criminal contempt. And if it's criminal contempt, you need to have a hearing for Brian Steele for due process purposes. The judge, Judge Glanville, seemed to disagree. Let's play a little of this. Is the criminal contempt, is it criminal contempt that you held him in? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you said you had a hearing earlier today. I No, I, with criminal contempt, I told him what the contempt was, and that was he refused to tell, you know, order of the court, if counsel, as you know, if the court orders you to do something and you don't, that's criminal contempt. So I've asked him several times, please just tell me who it is that told you. That I didn't ask or inquire about anything that was said. I just want to know who it was. Now, Mr. Steele has indicated to us he does not believe that he can answer the question without violating his duty of loyalty and duty of confidentiality to his client. So he is being placed in a position where he's either going to jail or he's going to commit an offense that will put his license to practice law at risk. And that is an untenable position to be in. And Mr. Steele is a zealous advocate for his client and he is simply trying to protect that duty of loyalty and duty of confidentiality because if he answers your question, it is very reasonable to assume and likely that he will be facing a bar complaint that could result in um, a suspension or in, in the loss of his license. And so he's in a, in a, in a very, very difficult position where if we were able to have a full contested hearing with the benefit of witnesses and an impartial judge where you're a witness, then everybody could present their side that. of the story. And I'm not doing that. The reason being is because that, that takes away the whole point of criminal contempt. And that is you do something, the court tells you to do something, order of the court, and you don't follow, and you don't follow it. I didn't ask him to do anything illegal, immoral, unethical. I just asked him to tell me, I know what the, what. no, you did something illegal, immoral, and unethical, and you created an automatic reversal. According to Ashley Merchant, who, if you guys have not seen that tell all interview that I um, reviewed on my channel, you're going to want to hear that. And she was right that, and then the Georgia Supreme court is looks like they are seeing it the same way. And we're going to get some more breakdown of that. Um, and why that's the case. And, and it's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of, it's one of those things where you you have to see it to believe how idiotic this actual judge is and he does not know the law. Hence in point with him not knowing, Ashley Merchant having to school him on the difference between civil contempt and criminal contempt, which is a basic tenet, a basic thing that you would think the head judge of Fulton County would know. What the, what the, priv I, what the privilege is, the privilege is, I, is the conversation. I didn't ask him about that. I wanted to ask him about who, the person, and because Mr. that, we could, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Mr. Steele has indicated to us that he does not believe he can answer that question without also violating the privilege. Ben, it's not like a witness was held in criminal contempt. It's not like the defendant was, it's a lawyer. And it's the lawyer representing one of the key uh, defendants in this case. And, and the question becomes, should there be a separate hearing? Is Judge Glanville a witness in this case? Um, was it too premature to just, he's held in criminal contempt and that's it? Jesse, I, I agree with the, the purport behind the question. I think there certainly should have been a hearing. I think on the underlying issue of whether it was appropriate for Steele to withhold the information, that's a legitimate issue, a colorable issue at, at the least that should have been adjudicated then to the extent the court determined that the information was not subject to attorney work privilege product uh, protection or any other privilege, then you get to the issue of whether, I, th I think Steele, assuming that the, the result was that the, the information should be disclosed, then I think Steele should be given an opportunity to reconsider his position. Then you get to the issue of whether there should be whether he should be held in contempt of court criminally or civilly. But I, I do think Judge Glanville put the cart before the horse. Again, I understand his frustration and wanting to keep the, the case on track, but I, I think this is a legitimate issue 
that he just um, he ignored and he, mm -hmm. he went too fast. So a uh, merchant, she also advised Judge Glanville that there were like 25 attorneys from the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers that were outside the court. They were ready to jump in to represent Mr. Steele. They were waiting in the hallway. And what that does is it actually leads me to what was filed by Steele's counsel. It was called an emergency motion for a supersedious bond on criminal contempt. And they make several arguments that the judge had a duty to recuse himself from the contempt proceeding, uh, that Steele's rights were violated because he was obligated to have a hearing, and that if you're going to hold Steele in criminal contempt, you need to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt that he interfered with the administration of justice and that he knowingly exceeded the bounds of what is allowed in advocating for your client. And they were asking for a supersedious bond be granted while the contempt finding is appealed and that the jail sentence be paused or stayed. The Georgia Supreme Court ended up granting it. So he stays out of jail for now. He's not going to have to report to jail on Friday night. What do you think about the fact that the Georgia Supreme Court uh, ruled in this way? Well, I think they did the right thing because I think the, the court got ahead of itself. I think there should have been due process on the underlying issue of whether this was protected and also on whether Steele's conduct was contumacious or whether he was in the horns of the dilemma. On the one hand, he, as he said, he didn't want to be held in contempt. He was not he was not intentionally defying the judge. He was caught between the proverbial rock and a hard place. So I do think that the Georgia Supreme Court did the right thing. Now, whether the judge needs to recuse himself from these proceedings or from the underlying proceedings, I think that's a separate issue. But I can think, I can I amplify that a little bit because yes. there's another lawyer in this case, Doug Weinstein, I believe he represents Yak Gotti, filed a motion for Judge Glanville to recuse himself from the case. And he alleged in that motion that in that ex parte meeting, among other things, Copeland would sit in jail for two years rather than testify. Copeland said that or allegedly said that that Glanville allegedly told Copeland he could lock him up until the other defendants were tried that Copeland said he would lie on the stand, that he would confess to killing Thomas. And the prosecutor allegedly said that she would try him for perjury if he said that on the stand. And Glanville allegedly printed out the perjury statute for Copeland. So Weinstein says that there is clearly a bias here. They, there's a feeling that the judge is intimidating a witness, that this ex parte meeting violated his client's constitutional and statutory rights, and that Glanville, again, improperly coerced Copeland to testify. Weinstein said to him, don't you want to remove the cloud over this case? Glanville seemed to be very upset by that and told him to basically tread carefully. Ben, what's your take on the fact that, again, if those allegations are true about what was said in that meeting, does Judge Glanville need to recuse himself? And did he too quickly decide that he shouldn't? Actually, it looks like he's saying yes, but let me just say this. Um, also, and this is one of the other key things, I'm not sure why he didn't mention it. Little Woody said that he was going to get on the stand and just lie and just lie about everything. The district attorney in front of the judge said, if you lie on the stand, that's fine. I will not prosecute you for perjury. But if you then admit that you killed Lil Nut, who were trying to put that on Young Thug and his co-defendants, if you say you are the killer and tell the truth about that, then we are going to then prosecute you for perjury, even though that would be the truth. So we, were, we want you to lie to keep the case going forward. And the judge was part of that conversation in supporting perjury of that witness, Little Woody. In light of those allegations, I think as you well know from your experience, judges have to avoid not only impropriety, but also the appearance of impropriety or the appearance of bias. And this is not every case. This is not a typical case. You know, the slippery slope argument, I don't think applies here where there are specific allegations that the judge is taking sides and made these comments. And these are mere allegations. It does put his impartiality at risk. And it sounds like the prudent thing for him to do would be uh, to step aside, even if he strongly believes that 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 the allegations are false. He's we, now been alleged to have been a participant rather right. than an umpire.
I guess, well, first of all, that would throw this whole case into flux and whether or not we have to start all over. But I, I think the other way of looking at it is if you have a witness who's basically threatening to lie uh, on the stand, it would not necessarily be improper for a judge to say you could be charged for, for perjury. Um, and his legal counsel was there. Copeland's lawyer was there, right? So is it just the fact that defense counsel wasn't made aware of it, that defense counsel wasn't there? Is it really a violation uh, of their client's rights? Be, or, or have you ever seen before a situation where such an important witness has had this private meeting, uh, again, represented, but this private meeting with the prosecutors and the judge? I have not. Um, as you know, I'm mostly a, a civil attorney. I, right. I have not experienced this ever. I haven't heard of it. And I, I do think original sin is the wrong word because we're not talking about that. But I think that the judge's original sin here was to have this ex parte meeting without notifying the defendant, because mm -hmm. I think that yeah. that started the whole series of events that have become so problematic. So, Ben, I, before I let you go, I have to ask you about this final point. So, um, Actually, I got two final points. I lied. But first of all, it's being reported that it seems the judge believes he figured out who re relayed this information uh, to Brian Steele because the judge seemingly doubled down, ordered a show cause hearing to be held with Copeland, Copeland's attorney or stand in attorney, Kayla Bumpus, prosecutors, everyone at that ex party hearing, and that they have to show cause why one or all of them shouldn't be held in contempt um, of court for allegedly sharing this information to the ex parte meeting. And during the judge's um, conversation with Brian Steele, he seemed to intimate that he believes it was Miss Bumpus who gave that information to Brian Steele, which we talked about. They, he set a hearing for June 25th. Can she get in trouble for sharing that information with Brian Steele? Yeah, theoretically she could. If the judge ordered that this that those proceedings be sealed and kept confidential? Yes, that she could be. I mean, she has, she's in a somewhat different position than Mr. Steele, at least arguably. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, unless there's some kind of uh, joint defense agreement between Ms. Bumpus's client and Mr. Steele's client, I, I think she's in a different position and a precarious position. But that doesn't, I mean, show cause hearings are, as you know, are not uncommon. And at those proceedings, it is important to show cause for each of the people summoned to, to show why they weren't in, in contempt of the court's order. So right. that raises a whole different set of issues. And I think she has some vulnerability there. And I think Copeland actually fought. The reason why I think it's not going to be an issue for her because it's fruit of the poisonous tree. The meeting shouldn't have taken place in the first place. And that Brian Steele was given information that he should have had from the judge. And even the things that happened in the meeting were illegal. So if you want to go back to that, she has a complete defense rock solid against that because it, it, the judge should have never had the meeting in the first place. The things that were talked about were illegal and that Brian Steele and the other co-defendants counsel had a right to be there so her relaying that information is proper everything the the meeting itself and everything that took place in it is the thing that was illegal so she's essentially reporting a crime and reporting it to people that are were allowed to know about it fired bumpus uh, by the way or tried to fire bumpus um i want to before i let you go now i have to ask you one final question it's should a mistrial be granted here the idea of uh, holding a, an attorney who is representing a key defendant in this case in contempt of court, even whether he's going to jail or not, the fact that you do that, is this grounds for a mistrial? Is this whole case tainted? I, I don't think so necessarily. I, I don't think any of this took place in the presence of the jury. Uh, I mean, if the jury were aware of this and were aware that uh, ju the, the judge and the defense counsel were at odds, I think you do need a mistrial because, as you know, juries often look to the judge and look up to the judge, and that could poison it. But I think, as I understand it, this has all been kept outside the the understanding of the jury, and so I, I don't think I think it's too early for a mistrial. All right, we will.
So even though he may not see it as a mistrial, because I don't think he has all the information, if I'm honest with you. And again, he's a civil attorney, not a criminal attorney. But one of the things to keep in mind, it, it, let's just say in a magical world, this wasn't for a mistrial. This is an automatic reversal, meaning regardless of if Young Thug and his co-defendants are found guilty, this issue alone, on top of the other hundreds of issues that have been in this trial, this is an automatic reversal. That will be reversed by the Supreme Court, by an appellate court. Like this is, the, this trial is, over and this is what generally every legal expert who's been following this case has said this this is unprecedented and this judge is off the reservation so i'm going to bring you another legal analysis of some experts some youtube uh, experts um lawyers that have said that this is that this is uh, automatically um going to be a mistrial and 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 a, um, and a reversal and that there needs to be criminal investigations into the da's office into fonnie willis's office and into this judge and i believe the person that is again that blew up fonnie willis before fanny pack willis she doesn't like me calling her fanny Annie, which she said in church, if you haven't seen that video, <laughs> where she called me out essentially, but didn't use my name, um, that, that, that essentially that Ashley Merchant who blew up that case is going to be the linchpin when it comes to this whole contempt, contempt hearing and trial that's for Brian Steele is going to be the thing that blows the doors open because it's going to bring into what was done and said in that ex parte meeting. And we're going to get it sooner rather than later. We're not going to get it. The judge was like, well, you'll get it once if the court, if this, if this trial goes to appeal, which could be years from now, we're talking about, we're going to get this soon because Brian Steele's um, actual contempt of court before the Supreme court, that, that trial needs to happen. It's going to happen sooner or his hearing is going to happen sooner. So then we're going to have to get the transcripts. We're going to have to get the audio recordings and we're going to see Ashley Merchant once again, take down DA uh, Fannie Willis. And I think this will be even more encompassing than what we saw before. And also take down this judge and bring down the Fulton County entire court system. It's insane. So guys, make sure that you, um, that you subscribe, hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss any of my updates. I'm going to be bringing you some more of Crazy Woody's um, testimony and many other people, like I've said before, one of the the cops in in, in the situation, one of the police officers in the situation, detective, um, had one of the told one of the witnesses that asked her when she's going to give him some booty. Uh, I mean, you have cops that have hid evidence. It has just been a shite show from day one and it's just getting worse and worse as it continues to go on. So you're not going to miss any minute of that, any minute of that. And I will see you guys on the next one.